I want to do a quick video about immunotherapy for recurrent or metastatic head and neck cancer. There's two drugs that are um, FDA approved for head and neck cancer, and they are nivolumab and prem pembrolizumab. And uh, they might be better known by their trade names. So nivolumab is called Opdivo. It's by Bristol-Myers Squibb. And uh, pembrolizumab is called Keytruda by Merck, okay? So I, there's two phase three trials that are most recent um, regarding these two medications. So let's go over the nivolumab one first. This one was the first one to get FDA approval. This um, phase three trial is published in 2016 in the New England Journal. And basically, let's go over um, briefly this study. So methods, they looked for patients that had confirmed recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck of the oral cavity, pharynx, or larynx um, that was not amenable to curative treatment. So that means they could not get surgery or radiation um, to those areas. And that's usually because it's not surgically resectable, um, because it was involving the skull base or carotid or some other structure that could not be resected. And it was not amenable to radiation, most likely because they had already had radiation before. Then uh, the other inclusion criteria was they had tumor recurrence or progression within six months after the last dose of platinum-containing chemotherapy. So they, these, a lot of these patients had the standard chemo chemotherapy regimen for uh, squamous cell carcinoma with head and neck is a platinum-based therapy, uh, usually cisplatin or carboplatin, and these people failed um, the cisplatin-based therapy. So they're they're. Uh, their uh, patient population that they're treating in this phase three trial is a very difficult uh, patient population that has failed all conventional therapy. They have to be at least 18 years of age, obviously, to consent. They have to have an ECOG performance status of zero or one. So there is basically a something called a ECOG or Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group performance status score, where you can score people based on how well their overall health is. And they have to be fairly healthy. So zero, or, zero means very healthy, and they had a lot of, uh, they could, you know, they can walk, take care of themselves, bathe themselves, that kind of thing. One, or they have some minimum, um, uh, minimum disability. Five is like they're bed bedridden. Um, so um, they had to be fairly healthy, other than their cancer. Um, they had to have adequate bone marrow, hepatic, and renal function to tolerate the uh, chemotherapy. And they had to have disease uh, that was measurable according to the RISIST method, the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. This is just a method that they have standardized to see is the tumor responding to the treatment that you're going to give. So major uh, exclusion criteria are brain metastases, so um, autoimmune disease or systemic immunosuppression. Obviously, because autoimmune disease it would be made worse, most likely, by a uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor or um, systemic immunosuppression that won't work well if you're trying to give people immunotherapy. Uh, and then, you know, HIV, um, hepatitis B, those kinds of things are going to cause immunosuppression or hepatic suppression. So what they did is they randomly assigned these patients in a two-to-one ratio. So uh, there was twice as many of the patients getting the Optivo or nivolumab as uh, the people that are going to get conventional uh, uh, chemotherapy, which is in this case methotrexate um, or cetuximab. Cetuximab is the anti-IGF. Um, no, EGF, sorry. Anti-EGF uh, uh, monoclonal antibody. So then the primary endpoint was overall survival. So they're trying to see if, if people survived, how long they survived for. Okay, so let's look at their results. So uh, results, previous treatment included radio, so most of the patients had radiation therapy and um, half of them had had two or more um, lines of uh, chemotherapy, most likely cisplatin based. And then if you look at their ca patient characteristics, um, this, this column is the nivolumab group. So you see there's twice as many as in the standard therapy group. These are the people getting methotrexate um, or let's see, what was it? Yep, 
Yeah, methotrexate and docetaxel or cetuximab. Okay, so that was the standard treatment. So this column is nivolumab. This column is either uh, cetuximab or methotrexate and uh, docetaxel. Median age is similar, okay, about 60 in both, mostly men, over 80%, mostly white, uh, mostly smokers. This, this, all, this is basically, this is the patient profile for um, head and neck cancer. It's mostly older men um, that are white. Then uh, most of them had a ECOG performance status score of one. And then this is a little bit uh, unusual. They have a large percentage that are oral cavity. Um, this is, uh, for, in, for some reason, this trial is skewed towards oral cavity cancers. Usually oral cavity cancers are not half of all head and neck cancer, squamous cell carcinomas. Um, all right, so that's their patient criteria. Okay, now this is what we want to know. Um, how effective was the treatment? So about 50% of the patients who underwent uh, randomization to the nivolumab group died during this trial, and 70% of the standard therapy group died. That's a high uh, death rate, but not unusual given that this is recurrent or metastatic disease where survival overall is uh, un unfortunately pretty poor. Median survival was five months. So that means half the people um, died before five months and half the people lived longer than five months. And the, the longest person that survived in this trial was 16 months. Uh, doesn't mean they died at 16 months. That's when the trial ended. So they were probably still alive at the end of the trial. Uh, so they found out that median overall survival in the nivolumab group was five, 7.5 months versus five months in the standard therapy group. So they got two and a half months on average uh, longer survival in the nivolumab group, which shows that the nivolumab was working better than the standard therapy. What's most interesting to me is actually the complete uh, response rate. Let's look at this. And this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. This basically shows as time goes on, what percentage of the people were alive. So at 12 months, 36% um, of the people in the nivolumab group were alive and 17% in the standard therapy group were alive. So you see that there is a difference and the nivolumab is doing better. This is progression-free survival. That means they're alive and the cancer isn't growing. So in a large percent of these patients, the cancer is still growing, but they're still alive. So if you want to know uh, what percentage of the patients um, are alive at 12 months and the, the cancer has not progressed, that's less than 10% in the nivolumab group and basically 0% in the standard therapy group. Okay, Okay. so this is the one that's most uh, interesting to me. Response rate among nivolumab-treated patients was 13%. So 13% had a response. Um, that means the tumor shrunk at least a little bit. Um, six percent had complete response. Six people had complete responses. So six out of 240, that's about two percent. Two percent of the patients had complete responses. This means that their cancer disappeared um, during, the, um, during the trial period. It doesn't mean that they were necessarily cured because it might have come back later, but there was no evidence that the cancer was there. So they were again in remission. And 26% had partial responses. In the standard therapy group, one had a complete response. So that's about 1% out of 120. Um, and then the median response, uh, and then six partial responses. So that was a 6% uh, response rate. Okay. And then they showed basically that if they had PD-1 uh, ligand expression. So the nivolumab is a programmed death receptor inhibitor. And this is a checkpoint on T cells. So T cells are part of your um, uh, cellular Im immune system and T cells destroy cancer cells. And this programmed death receptor basically suppresses a T cell function. So this uh, nivolumab blocks that. And so there's this ligand called programmed death ligand that's expressed by a bunch of tumor cells. 
And if, if more tumor cells are um, expressing it, you can see that they have better response rate to the nivolumab, which makes sense. So like uh, right here, if there's more than 5% head expression, then uh, the nivolumab median survival was 8.8, .8, as opposed to 7.5 for all patients. So if they had none, they did, they did poorly. So see, if, you, if they had no um, expression, then it was about the same as the standard therapy. Okay, so let's switch gears to the pembrolizumab study. This is also um, a, a PD-1 uh, PD um, receptor inhibitor. And what they did, let's look at their trial. It's very similar to the other one. So this was a phase three trial done in 300 medical centers in 37 countries. So a lot of different places. Um, they had to be over 18, just like the other study. They had to have pathologically confirmed squamous cell carcinoma, the oral pharynx, oral cavity, hyperpharynx, or larynx, just like the other study. That was recurrent and metastatic and not curable by local therapy. Again, these patients could not be resected surgically and could not get radiation, probably for the same reasons as the other group. Had an ECOG performance status of zero or one, that's the same as the other study, and had at least one tu tumor that was measurable by RISIST criteria. Uh, so that's Again, exact same um, criteria as the other one. And then known P16 expression for oral pharyngeal cancers, that was the same as the other one. Participants were excluded if they had progressive disease within six months of curatively intended systemic treatment given for locally advanced disease. Okay, so this is what's different. Though the nivolumab study, they included patients that had progressive disease within six months. This one, they excluded them. They didn't, so basically, probably the nivolumab study patients had worse cancers because they, they took on the cancers that had previously failed systemic therapy. These people could not have failed systemic therapy. And then if they had um, brain meds, um, needing glucocorticoids or active autoimmune disease. So that's basically the same as the other one. So the only difference is, is this study um, excluded patients that progressed on um, systemic treatment, whereas the nivolumab study included those, those patients. So, in this study, they wanted to give pembrolizumab uh, once every two, three weeks. Nivolumab is once every two weeks, so it's a little more frequent. And then they were going to give it for 36 cycles. Uh, every three weeks for 36 cycles is about two years. And then they treated the, the three groups were pembrolizumab alone, pembrolizumab plus cisplatin or carboplatin, and then the third group was cetuximab plus cisplatin or carboplatin. So they are using the standard therapy, cisplatin or carboplatin, in five floor a year or so. That is standard uh, um, therapy for squamous cell carcinoma. All right, so what? this one has a pretty nice flow sheet. Okay, so here's the flow sheet. They got uh, 1,228 patients screened, and then basically they divide it up into three groups. 300 assigned to the pembrolizumab alone group, 278 to the pembrolizumab plus carboplatin or cisplatin and 5-FU, and then 300, oh, um, actually 287 assigned to the cetuximab plus chemotherapy group. Then if you look at this, out of 300, 269 discontinued treatment in this arm, 249 in this arm, 278 in this arm. And you see the reasons for why they stopped treatment. 186 of them had um, the tumor progressed when, when they looked at it on CAT scan or MRI. This one, 157. This one, 185. Uh, 34 in this group had an adverse event. So that means they had some kind of side effect that was so serious that they stopped the trial on, on those patients. 44 here and 45 here. 26 had clinical progression. So these people progressed so obviously they didn't even need radiography to, to confirm it. Uh, 21 here and 16 here. And then 10 people decided to quit on their own. 13 here and 18 here. And then this is the most... Um, Important thing, so six had complete response. That's about 2% of 300. Nine had complete response of here. That's about 3% of 300. And three had complete response, which is about 1% of 300. So that's very similar to the nivolumab. Nivolumab had 2% complete response. 
and their standard therapy had one percent. This is the same standard therapy has about one one percent, two percent here, and three percent if you add um, kind of standard therapy plus the Pembro. Three deaths, two deaths, two deaths, one loss to follow up. Okay. So in this arm, fifty one complete people completed the entire two year treatment. Twenty seven here. There is no endpoint in here, so. Um, Nine people were continuing treatment here in this arm. And then if you look at um, their uh, patient characteristics, it's very similar to the Novolab group, about 60 years old, mostly men, 80%. Um, ECOG status, mostly one. Mostly smokers, 80% smokers. That's very similar to the other side. And then what they did in this study is they also looked at... Um, the PD, uh, uh, PDL, Program Death Ligand 1 uh, CPS. This stands for Combined Positively Score. This is the percentage of the cells, all cells, not just the tumor cells, but all cells in the tumor, because there's a lot of non-tumor cells in the tumor, stromal cells, the immune system cells. Um, if, if greater than... 85% of them had at least some positivity, and half the tumors had very strong positivity. And then if you look at their primary tumor location, you can see it's fairly evenly distributed. Their oral cavity is only 20 to 30%. The other one was almost 50% oral cavity, so that one skewed a little bit more to oral cavity. And then you see that uh, pembrolizumab does better uh, in this Kaplan um, my, and you can see that their survival rate in this trial is higher, um, you know, 57% versus 39%. But that's probably because the other study chose patients that had failed systemic therapy. So they were a, a tougher cancer group. So basically, the, bo both of these studies showed that pembrolizumab or and nivolumab were helpful in this setting. And that's why they got FDA approval. Um, and what's uh, interesting about this is that they have about a 2%, 2 to 3% success rate in, in terms of complete uh, response. So um, possible cures in 2 to 3% of patients versus the typical of about 1% or less than 1%. Then I found this interesting poster from uh, ACOG. Um, I think this was like a year or so ago. And they were just basically looking at the cost. And so the cost for a for treating someone with pembrolizumab is about $200,000. And for nivolumab, about $130,000 for 18 months of treatment. So that's extremely expensive. So you figure if you, if you treated 300 people... At two hundred thousand dollars, that's sixty uh, million dollars. Six hundred, uh, yeah, sixty million dollars, and then for six complete responses, that's about ten million dollars per complete response. So that is um, why some insurance companies will not cover this because th they have, you know, there's a finite amount of money, unfortunately, and they have to decide if they're going to spend ten million dollars to save. A, you know, someone who's about in their late 60s um, save their life versus they could save, you know, lots of, you know, they could probably do lots of treatment for young kids and save their life for the same cost. And so if it's a cost analysis, this may not win out. And then I'll link these two other articles, which are very interesting articles, um, which are reviews of what these checkpoint um checkpoint uh, inhibitor uh, immunotherapies are. There's a lot of different uh, methods that are coming down the pipeline. Currently, the only two that are FDA approved for head and neck cancer are pembrolizumab and nivolumab. They are both PD-1 um, uh, antibodies. And so they work the same way, but there's like CTLA-4 antibodies and uh, TIM-3 antibodies coming down the pipeline and also work on some kind of cyt um, cytokine adjuvants so there's a lot of work coming down the pipeline in um, immunotherapy for head and neck, which I think will be quite exciting. 
and should be good. Hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have more success than this. The important thing to try to figure out now is what people, you know, is there a way we can figure out what are those two to 3% that are going to respond very well? Um, if we could figure that, we could target this therapy to them and um, this would work really well for them. It's It, it definitely seems that having more PD-L1 um, expression helps. And um, so that's why they're testing people for that before treating them with this. But uh, this is definitely a improvement over the previous therapy we had before these were available. It's a modest improvement, but definitely an improvement.